Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale Cadillac Gauge V100 armor car, also known as the M706. Since the last video update, a ton of progress has been made to this model over here and in its current condition, this model is 98% Done. I'm not talking about done in regards to, you know, ready for painting or, and, you know, detailing. No, 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 no. As in done, finished, finito, completo, all of that stuff. This model here is so close to the finish line, it's basically just a hair away from crossing it. In this video, we're going to be going over all of the additions that have been made to this model since the previous video. So stay tuned, grab some popcorn, because it's going to be a really great video for everyone to enjoy. Picking up where we last left off, the model is now fully weathered. The last of the weathering techniques have just been applied. At this point here, I'm ready to carry on to the next step. For the weathering, I utilize the same techniques that I generally mention and show in my other videos, which consists of the use of countershading with the airbrush, and then I also use Tamiya panel line accents and dry brushing to give you the final end result that you see here. With the weathering work out of the way, the model's currently sitting here with all of its hatches in the open position because I'm just removing all of the masks that I added in the previous video. As a quick recap, all of the internal periscope sections had masking tape and tissue paper added to these locations in order just to prevent the inside from getting affected with lots of overspray. This is really relevant because of the interior paintwork done on the turret as well as on the hatches. You want to protect those and the best way to do that is to just make sure that no overspray enters through the periscopes. With all the masking tape removed, the model is now ready to head off into its next leg, which is probably the funnest portion on one of these large builds, and that is installing all of the fine detail components on the outside that needed to have been done after everything was painted and weathered. So, first thing we're going to do is get this thing back on its set of wheels. Let's go ahead and get that done. So putting the wheels back on the model takes a little bit longer time compared to taking them off. Regardless, I should still be able to get it done in a fairly quick period of time. Let's go close that hatch first. Just kind of line up the holes, make sure they find their sweet spot, and then the wheel should just go and nest in appropriately, just like so. With the wheel placed on its location, it's now time to secure it in place. And as I mentioned in a few videos that came out before this one, on this model here, these are secured on in place like the real one with the use of fasteners. Here I have the fasteners for the entire model, well, some spares. And you'll see they're on this piece of masking tape here and they have already been pre-painted and pre-weathered off the model. This is a trick that I've mentioned in a few other videos. I believe a few Armor Tech videos come to mind. And it's done for the exact same reason. If you go ahead and build a model like this, paint and weather, it'll be really anticlimactic to have the fasteners not match. So in order to prevent that, you take all of the fasteners required, you paint and weather them off the model with the same paint and techniques that are used on the remainder of the build, and then when the time comes, you simply install everything and it'll just blend right in as it should. One last pro tip I want to mention is that if you are going with this technique, you want to have more than just the correct number of fasteners that are ready to go for installation that are pre-painted and weathered. The reason is quite simple. Fasteners have a really bad habit on having wacky things happening to them. Either you'll drop one, it'll fling off the Lost Partia, or you know, whatever situation can happen. Regardless, the last thing you want to do during your moment of glory is to have to, you know, start from scratch and repaint whether all of the fasteners that are required in order to make up the ones that you lost. So in order to prevent that, just, you know, it's not too hard to squeeze a few more extra fasteners on some masking tape over here so that everything is painted and weathered at the same time. And if you have any mishaps, you it's okay. You do have an insurance policy waiting for you. Fortunately though, if everything pans out, that shouldn't be the case on this build over here. But again, it's always great to have extras just in case. So as I'm installing the fasteners, one other thing I want to mention, this is a huge departure compared to the other videos that are found on the ECA channel, specifically with 1.6 scale models, is that I am not, keyword not, utilizing any sort of Loctite or adhesives on the threads while securing these in place. Generally in these videos, I always mention, oh, Loctite's a must, you know, for all of these various reasons. However, for this model over here, that's not going to be the case. This model is static, of course, and on top of that, in case uh, a need were to arise where I was to take the wheel off, they are not going to be stuck on there with any sort of extra thread lock. So for this type of an application over here, 
you could just roll with the bolts in their, or I should say, in the fasteners in their El Natural form with no thread lock being necessary. With the two wheels now secured back into their locations, the last thing I want to do before I flip over to the opposite side is to finish off the tires. You might be saying to yourself, but John, the tires are complete. They're fitted to the model. Yes, but there's one bit of detailing that's missing, and if you look right over here in dead center, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. On the real V100 armor car, there are these hubcaps found in these locations over here, and if we can recall all the way back into one of the earlier videos where I actually did the wheels and installed them onto the model, I said that there is a bit of detailing needs to be added, and I have that bit of detailing, and it's right here. This little bit of detailing is supplied with the ECA sets, by the way, but now you get to see what it looks like fully painted. Of course, this is 3D printed, and now that the units are fully painted and weathered, you really get a good idea on what the detailing looks like on them. These pieces have the correct geometry as well as the fasteners found on these areas over here. And the units are designed to just plug directly into place. The only thing I need to do is snip off the pieces from the sprue and then just plug them where they need to go. For the installation, you can either super glue them, but I think I might white glue them in place on this one just in case I need to get access to the fastener over here that may need to be tightened up, you know, as the model ages. So that's why I think I'm going to be rolling with the Elmer's glue, just again so it's nice and it's a temporary bond, but it's one that can be popped off without any detrimental effects to the model itself. And on that note, it looks like this wheel was a little loose, so... There we go. Much better. So as you can see, the hub fits onto the rim without a whole lot of work. Just some slight hand fitting is required with the Dremel and high speed removal bit in order to get the hub to fit on into its proper location. The tolerances are a bit tight, so removing a little bit of material here or there is more than suffice for getting the installation completed. With the side view mirrors installed, it's now time to work on the headlight cluster. So first I'm gonna start with the cluster themselves. You'll notice that I painted the inside portions with the silver paint. If we can recall, the ECA headlights are a multi-part assembly where we have a frame as well as a clear 3D printed insert that gets mounted on the inside. And here's the component right here. So what I did was I went ahead and painted the inside portions here of the housings with silver so that when the unit is installed, it gives for a nice realistic glow of the silver backings that are found on headlights. One other thing I do want to reference is that one thing I found unique specifically for the V100s in Vietnam was that both of the headlights are standard white light. Why this is relevant is that because if you look at this design of headlight cluster used on other military vehicles like on the M60, the Sheridan, and so on and so forth, you'll notice know that one of these is white light and the other one is a blackout light. However, for one reason or another, on all the reference pictures that I've seen of this vehicle in Vietnam, it seems that that wasn't the case and they were both white light. So that was an interesting turn of events. So for this one here, I'm just going to roll with the way that I see it in the photographs of the real example. The unit is already plugged in, as you can see. There's no glue or anything used on this in any which way, shape, or form, and simply just gets dropped in like you see here. The piece fits on so tight that honestly, it doesn't even need a drop of glue. It just goes ahead and fits on into this manner like you see presently. And with that, the unit is now fully assembled and fully installed. With the camera off the tripod, you could really get a better appreciation of the look of the transparent 3D printed components, as well as with the background of the housing being painted with the silver paint. It does lead for some very realistic results like you see here. 
Also, as I mentioned, the reason why everything is hollow and also subdivided on the actual printing is because this unit does have the capability of being configured with a multitude of LEDs. This is clearly intended for use for radio control, so you can have your unit with the standard light, the blackout light, or even the other two shrouded lights that we have here and here. All of which can be configured with relative ease if you are intending to make this model fully radio controlled. And with the way the insert here encompasses all of the lens sections, it just drops in as one segment, as I mentioned in that other video, which again leads itself for greater simplicity of assembly. The next thing to mention about the cluster is with the lens cap that needs to be added to the indicator light. The indicator light, again, is a hollow 3D printing. It's also listed on the ECA catalog. And you can see what it looks like with the detailing now fully completed. And by detailing, I'm specifically referring to the wire. So the plug section is integrally printed onto the housing. That just gets painted with a little bit of rubber black paint or flat black, depending on whichever one you have on hand and prefer. The wire is small electrical wire. This is something that is supplied with the ECA set. And basically, it plugs into the hole that's found on the back portion of the headlight cluster, which completes the detailing that you see there. On the unit on the opposite side, it's the exact same format. However, instead of one wire going to the back, there's two, because on this side over here, we have the connection for the siren, which is seen right over here. Also, now with this unit fully painted and weathered, you really get to appreciate those fine, small little details I was referencing in the earlier videos when I mentioned this part in more depth. The top portion, you can see the two terminal points and how it emerges from the siren and enters into the rear portion there of the headlight cluster, just like it does on the other unit. The hole is big enough for both wires to plug into the way you see it here. However, the cluster isn't quite completed just yet because there is a lens that gets added to the front section and that lens detailing is what I have right here in my hand. So this here is the part that's supplied with the ECA set. It is made out of an HD translucent material, which gives it for some very excellent realism. And also, as I mentioned before, the inside portion has the little ridges and ribs integrally printed on. This is because when you go ahead and paint it, you actually apply the paint to the inside portion. This here is Tamiya orange, but you could also utilize a translucent orange color of one flavor or another, as long as applied in the same exact location. Because if I flip it around on the outside, hopefully you'll be able to see the little ribs that are found on the inner area. And again, this just yields for some very excellent detailing and accuracy. By painting the inside portion orange, the entire unit itself has that glow to it, and it's almost as if it's molded in this color. In order to make the component even more polished, I added a quick little coat of Tamiya Gloss Clear to the exterior portions, and once it sets, it leaves for the result that you have here, which looks very, very reminiscent, again, of the actual unit. The only thing that needs to be done after the unit is fitted in place is with a small paintbrush, I'm going to add a small little drop of olive draft to each of the two fastener sections that are integrally printed on. Once those are painted up, the unit is fully completed. Also, as a quick plug, just like with the main headlight cluster, if the builder so chooses to do so, the reason why this is left hollow is so that you can also fit in a small micro LED in case you anticipate on making the unit fully lighted. And here's the front of the model with the headlight clusters now fully completed. In order to wrap them up, the last detailing was added, which is the addition of the meshwork. The mesh is something that I touched upon in an earlier video, but here's what the unit looks like now fully completed and with the mesh now fitted permanently in place. As I touched upon in the previous video, the reason why I did not add the meshwork on at that time was because of the headlight cluster. In order to get the lenses for both the headlight and the indicator in place, this is best done without the meshwork present. Because with the meshwork present, this really limits the amount of access you get to these areas over here, and this can just lead to potential issues. So to avoid any sort of headaches, these mesh sections are done at the very tail end like I've done on this build over here. The only catch is that when you're painting and weathering the model, be sure that you weather and paint the meshwork in the exact same manner at the same time with the same paints so that everything just blends in with the continuity like you see on this build here. 
Also, one other quick fact what I want to mention is that the mesh is an optional bit of equipment. If you're depicting a very early rendition of the V100 armor car, this was something that wasn't necessarily present. The mesh was added by the crews shortly after these vehicles started to be fielded in Vietnam. But after the mesh work were added by the crews, the newer production vehicles from Cadillac Gage had these units already installed fresh from the factory. So if you're rendering out a earlier rendition of the V100, the mesh is something that is an optional choice. But if you're rendering a later version of the V100, more often than not, the mesh would indeed be present. It is at this time where we're at probably the most important yet undersung bit of detailing found on the entire project, and that involves the detailing to finish off the periscopes. The V100 model here is very different compared to the other models I've built in the past on this channel, where the periscopes were either opaque, and so you just you know paint them with gloss black, or they're printed in a translucent type material like on some of the other components like I touched upon before. But for this one here, we're actually going to be utilizing polycarbonate. The Lexan that I'm going to be utilizing for the prisms is an excellent choice because it is the most transparent materials that you can get and it's also the easiest to work with. There is another option out there with utilizing sheets of acrylic but acrylic in my opinion is garbage. That stuff just shatters upon looking at it. Some guys are good at cutting it. Me? Uh -uh, I just never had any luck with it so that's why I roll with Lexan. The Lexan that I have here I picked up from Amazon.com and these by the way are going to be supplied with both the turret sets and also with the periscope sets not to mention the hatch sets. The ones for the turret are a thinner gauge, this is a 16 of an inch thick, while the periscope inserts for the hull are going to be an eighth of an inch. Both again are going to be made out of Lexan. This vehicle is going to utilize three types of periscopes. One is going to be used just for the hull, the other is going to be used on the turret exterior, and the third is for the turret interior. As I mentioned before, the turret has two layers of periscopes. One is on the outside and the other one is a sleeve that fits on the inside. And this is going to be accomplished with the Lexan that I have here. Now, in order to cut the components to shape, this is something that would generally be a bit problematic. So you have to make sure each and every one of them is drawn exactly to scale. However, in order to simplify that, I went ahead and printed out some stencils. The stencils here are on sticker paper. These two are going to be supplied with all these sets and basically just peel the sticker off, stick it to the Lexan and now you have the exact size of component that you need. So one thing I love about Lexan is that this stuff cuts like standard material, either a type of plastic or wood. You could utilize the bandsaw, you could sand it down with a file or a dremel. There's, it's just so much more versatile compared to using acrylic and so that's exactly what I'm going to be doing over here. These here are the periscope inserts for the turret as again this is the 16 of an inch but I have the other ones over here for the hull that I'll be cutting out momentarily. And here's the model with the lenses now mounted in place. It's a little tricky to get on camera, but if you see the model in person, it will definitely have a nice realistic look to it because the light will reflect from the ceiling. It'll definitely shine on the windows. It will give it a very realistic sheen to it. The 
Installation went by as smooth as humanly possible. As we saw, the Lexan grinds very easily on a bench grinder, so you don't even have to have any special tooling in order to get the pieces cut the shape and installed to their proper locations. For the installation, I utilized white glue, if you may have noticed. The reason why is the same reason that I mentioned in my smaller scale videos. White glue, in my opinion, is probably the best adhesive for securing clear plastic components in place, specifically things like canopies or windows and things along those lines. And the reason why I like white glue is because it doesn't have any detrimental effects on the material itself. If you utilize adhesives like super glue, for instance, is a big one with this, it will leave a white foggy cloud around the components when the glue finally sets. And this is something that's definitely less than ideal specifically for clear components. Other adhesives like Tester's Red Glue is just garbage. You know, that's just won't bond to anything, specifically the nylon on the 3D printed parts, but that's just a garbage glue altogether. And then there's also the other type of plastic cements that a lot of other individuals use. And those will also have detrimental effects on the plastic. If the cement somehow winds up on the edge or you know somehow on the center of the plastic you're going to be in for trouble because you're not going to be able to get it off because it's going to start melting it the white glue that's not the case the white glue is extremely forgiving first it dries as translucent as possible right now the glue is still wet so you may see some white showing on these clips over here but once the glue sets, it'll definitely be much more translucent in its overall effect. And also, it has zero detrimental effects to the material itself. And why this is important is, say, like, for instance, I ran this on the turret, actually. I was installing one of the prisms, it slipped out of my hand, landed on the, on the glue area, and I smudged up the glue all over the middle portion of the glass. Normally, this would be cause for concern, but because I was using white glue, it was a minor inconvenience if that. I simply just plucked the piece off, dipped in water, cleaned it off, and then just remounted it in place. No more, no less. The other bits of equipment that you see me mounting were the retention clips that we have here and here. These are supplied with the ECA sets and the runner contains more than enough for the hull components in hand. So here you can see the or what's left of the runner. You can see that there's two leftovers spare, but just like with the other components, I went ahead and painted it and weathered it along the same lines as the remainder of the vehicle at the same time for the same reasons that I mentioned with the lug nuts for the literally the exact same circumstances. So the pieces are fitted in place and once they are mounted, they look absolutely seamless and blend in with the remainder of the model's paintwork. The last thing I do want to mention about the prisms is that, as I mentioned before, I was going to originally use two thicknesses of polycarbonate in order to fabricate these components. Well, when it came time for actual production, I just utilized the one thickness, which was the 16 of an inch on all these units. The reason was quite simple. I ran out of the eighth of an inch material. So, you know, I'm like, yeah, let me roll the dice with the 16 of an inch. And as it turns out, it worked out absolutely perfectly. So the prisms that you see here are the 16 of an inch ones, and they are just fitted in place as the kit or as I originally designed with the thicker counterparts. From the hull periscopes takes us to the turret periscopes. Now, in addition to adding on the periscopes, I also went ahead and added all of the external detail fittings with the exception of the clear lens insert that's gonna be mounted on the optic, but that's something I'm going to be touching upon when I eventually get it from my manufacturer. But regardless, you get to see what the periscopes look like now that the turret in it is in its final detail form. So the periscope assembly is the exact same type of manufacturing method that I showed earlier. So there's nothing really much to mention there, but we can at least take a look what the final outcome looks like from the outside. And that's that glare that I was talking about before. Whenever you look at this model in certain light, again, it has that very realistic appearance. And also you get to see inside of the vehicle, again, which also leads for a very realistic effect. Now, one interesting thing you mentioned about the turret, like I touched upon before, is not just the external periscopes, but it also has a inner liner as well. If I pop the hatch open, hopefully it comes out on camera, but you can see the other prism panes secured in place. In addition to the periscopes being fitted, you can also see the addition of the lift rings. As I mentioned earlier, these did not survive manufacture. For some reason, the individual who printed out my turret over here went a little overzealous with trimming of the sprues and off went the eyelet rings. But here you can see what they look like now added in place. These ones are also 3D printed. I'm probably going to have these on a separate fret 
just so it makes manufacturing a bit easier and the installations are really quick. You just simply just drop them into the appropriate locations, which will have their markers found on the turret itself. But you get to see the three locations. You have the two right over here on the top. And interestingly, there's one here on the corner rather than being in the center portion. But again, this probably has to do with the geometry of the turret. But, you know, it's interesting to point out nonetheless. On the interior, the, well, it's also true for the exterior as well. The last edition were the MGs. Here go the M73s fitted in place. And now, as you can see, they are locked to the mantlet as they are on the real unit. The last bit of detailing, which I just got word that has been shipped from my manufacturer, is the arm that comes out of this section over here and wraps around. And that's, again, what's used to elevate and depress oops, this unit. And it's also, I believe, used to fire the two MGs simultaneously. But more information on that is to follow, along with the other remaining pads and eye optic covers that are, again, in that next shipment. But more information on that is to follow. Moving our way to the rear of the vehicle takes us to the some of the last of the details, which would include the taillight lens caps. Here we have the lens caps right over here. I touched upon these earlier on in the video series, but these here are the HD 3D printed ones from ECA, and these are the post-war examples, which are quite clearly seen. These units here have been painted, and of course these are done off the model because you really don't want to be masking these up, it's kind of a pain. It's easier to just hand paint them nice and carefully with a precision paintbrush, and then secure them after the fact, which is exactly how I'm doing it on this build. Here we have the left and right hand versions of the cat's eye. As for painting these units, well, just like with the other lenses that I mentioned on the front, you paint the inside with the color. So on this version over here, with the red cat's eye lens, on the flip side you'll see that I brushed some red paint on the top and some silver paint on the bottom. The, these, the red is Timia and the silver is Vallejo. They're both acrylics and that's important because this material here doesn't really like enamels. So acrylics are the way to go. But as you can see, once you paint the insides, the outside will have a very, very realistic look to it. And then for the outer portion here, this was just carefully painted with a paintbrush. I did actually paint the, the component with to me a flat black first with the paintbrush, and then I went over it with the exterior latex that I used for the base coat in order to get the look that you see here. The black acts as a, as a primer, and once the black is added, the other paint will stick to it much better. For the other one, the blackout light version, both the top and the bottom portion are silver, and so you just paint the back with the silver color. Just like with the headlights, these are also printed hollow, so that in case anyone out there is trying to work on a radio controlled one, you could put some LEDs in here for the same reason. These head or I should say these taillights here are also offered separately, so in case you're using or I get I should say in case you have any sort of a build that utilizes these type of taillights. I do have separate sets available, and they are listed on the ECA catalog, along with the World War II counterparts as well. The installation is really, really quick. I'm just going to add a little drop of glue here and here. And I don't honestly don't even need to do that per se. But once the glue is added, then take the cover cap, and you just press fit it into the appropriate location. Do the same thing to the opposite side, and the tail light is completed. Some of the very last details you're getting added to model at this time are the antenna bases. I already touched upon both of these antenna bases in one of the previous videos, but here you get to see what they look like in their final form. So on the one side here, we have the MP65. This is probably the only legacy item that's being used on this entire project. That's something that wasn't made in the modern era with the use of 3D printing. This set here dates back to like 2010 or so, and I went ahead and made this the old fashioned way on the lathe, and then I've been basically casting them in rubber ever since. What's noteworthy to point out about this particular build is that this is the first time I'm actually utilizing this part, even though it's been listed on the ECA catalog since, again, the 2010 time frame. This, by the way, is a part that I don't see being retired anytime soon, and basically, I nailed it when I designed this component all those years ago. So, 
If anyone is a fan of the smaller scale content, first, I just want to say thank you for that. You're the reason why I keep making these videos. But the second thing is, in those other videos, I generally mention on how these components get painted. And well, the bigger one here is no different, but because of the larger scale, it lends itself for some greater detailing that can be painted, which is something that you don't really get in the smaller scale counterparts. So let's go ahead and go over that. On the MP65, it is distinctive of having this honey dipper type insulator that we have right here. This component here on the real unit would be made out of porcelain and just like on the MP48 spring antenna bases, the porcelain is painted with Timia hull red. The hull red does a fantastic job with giving you that reddish brown color that would be present on the real units. After the hull red is dried, I brush over it with Timia gloss clear and this gives you the look that we have here which greatly emulates the porcelain glaze look that's found on the actual unit. Both of these were applied with the brush and what you see is the final end result of that. Also as I mentioned in those other videos the middle portion here is made out of rubber and the unit can flex and because the ECA one here is casted in rubber it greatly lends not only to the accuracy but you don't have to paint this you literally just leave this in the El Natural color that the piece is molded in and call it a day. Where you do need to paint is the top portion and the bottom portion. On this one over here you can see that little nut portion that's right over there. This is painted with olive drab and so is the top area here which would be metal and this is where the antenna wire would actually slip onto. On this one over here I'm going to leave it with the antenna wire off so you just see it in the following format. The other thing that I do want to mention is that when it comes for painting these areas over here you have a plethora of different options available. I've seen them in black, I've seen them in just a steel color and also like the way you see on this example, I have them in olive drab. All of which are correct, it just depends on what you want to do with your build. Me personally, I like painting them with the olive drab over here because it just gives a little bit extra color pop to the piece. With all the paint dry, this unit here is ready for installation. This leads us to the next antenna base, which is this unit that we have here. Unlike this one that was tooled up all those years ago, this one here is a relatively new addition to the ECA catalog and is made with modern manufacturing. So it's all HD 3D print, with the exception of the spring and the cup here, which are molded in rubber, but were made from 3D printed masters. The reason why I went ahead and made these out of rubber is so, well, one, with the eye cup, or I should say with the cover cap over here, you get the added realism of just like the real units made in rubber, so no painting or anything is required other than painting the fastener, like I did over here. And the spring section is painted, or I should say molded in rubber, so that it has some flexibility to it, and it lends itself for a unique detail type feature. The unit now is fully painted and assembled, which was something that was not mentioned in the previous videos. But now you get to see what it looks like completed. So. The bottom portion over here, I went ahead and painted with Tamiya Olive Green. Then the very top plate and the spring are painted with Tamiya Olive Drab. The very top fastener is just Tamiya Flat Black. And then panel line accent was added to give the look that you see here, which is perfect because it really highlights all the little subtle details and seam lines that are present on the printing. Of course, the antenna will be mounted after the unit is mounted in place. However, the antenna, I'm going to be utilizing a different material compared to the one that I touched upon earlier in the previous video, but I'll circle back to this momentarily. On the cover cap over here, you can see that the fastener is painted in gold, or it's basically brass on the real one, but the gold paint does a good job with simulating that. And as I mentioned before, you have the option of either rendering it with the antenna present, or you can actually have it with the piece covered up if you just glue the little cover cap on in a certain manner and you can actually display your model in the following position which again leads for some interesting detailing and also just some more versatility. I really must say that with the unit fully completed, painted and weathered, all of that hard work and those hours spent in CAD designing this unit over here have really really paid off. So enough of that, I'm going ahead and install these boat to the model. And here's the antenna that was referenced earlier. At this point it's fully painted, assembled, and is ready for installation. For the antenna itself, I did mention this in a previous video, however I actually switched materials since the previous time I mentioned it. The 
material originally for the antenna wire itself was a brass rod. However, I switched it to a piece of metal floor wire that's the exact same diameter. The reason why I did this was I felt that the brass was slightly too short compared to the length that I believe should be more appropriate for this type of vehicle. For the component itself, I actually was going to switch it out entirely with the use of plastic. I actually have some plastic rods here I picked up off of Amazon. They are the exact same diameter and the end connectors would have fit on this component here. However, in my opinion, it was a bit too flimsy for my liking, but I do see a application for this specifically if you're going to model the antenna with the unit in the tied down state. Perhaps the plastic rods here will probably be a better fit for you. For my model, however, since it's just going to be left in the straight position, I just simply went with the metal rod and I called it a day. The unit has its two end connectors fitted in place. These are the HD3D printed parts that were mentioned in the previous video and come with the antenna base set. Here we have the bottom portion right here. And here we have the top portion. For the antenna's paintwork, I went ahead and spray painted the entire unit with just some flat black spray paint. For the antenna midsection, this was airbrushed with a filter of Tamiya NATO Black. This gives it that grayish, blackish, parkerized look that we have here. And this is something that I was inspired from looking at real examples of these antennas that are floating online. There are lots of color options available to the builder, and this is something that's best left up to the builder's discretion on which one they deem appropriate for their build. For the bottom portion over here, I actually went ahead and painted it with Tamiya flat black after everything was said and done, and then I dry brushed it with a little bit of steel paint to give it that distressed look, which would be common from an antenna that's constantly being installed and then removed. On the top portion over here, on the real units, I've seen that they are a glossy plastic olive drab color, and some of them are just a glossy black color. Regardless, I went with the olive drab on this one here, just because it gives the, the piece a little bit more pop. To me, olive drab was painted on with a paintbrush, and then once set, I, I brushed over a nice little layer of Tamiya clear gloss, giving it for the glossy plasticky look that you see here. From this point on, this unit can be just mounted in place. Unlike many of the other antennas that are on my build, this one's not going to be mounted on permanently, and it's just going to be a removable piece because it just makes handling the model all that much more easier without this thing whipping around on you. With the way the ECA set is designed, the metal section will actually descend into the rubber portion here. This is to give added strength and surface area for the piece to be held on in a nice strong manner. On the rod itself you'll see that it descends from the detail cover plug that we have right here and this again is to facilitate that. Even though this is just primarily for detail it does have some structure support to it as well. If we notice on the ECA piece there is this plug section over here. This is obviously there on the real one and it in addition to adding for detail it also gives added surface area to the inner portion here of this threaded section. So to install I just basically install it by inserting it in place like so. Once the piece is firmly positioned the installation is complete and also with the unit connected to the model you get to see that the unit does have some flex to it, which was why I went ahead and rendered this with the rubber material from the beginning. And it does lend itself for some pretty good accuracy in that regard. Another weathering technique that I just added was with the addition of the rust that you see here on the rear exhaust manifold tips. The V100 was gasoline powered and so these sections here mounted directly on top of the exhaust muffler system are definitely going to get very very hot and if they get hot they are eventually going to have the paint burn off and it will develop rust. In addition to the rust I also have the soot that have been added on the tips as well. Both of the rusting and the soot weathering effects that you see here were added with the same method with the use of an airbrush. Jumping back down to the row wheels takes us to one little bit of detailing that I forgot to mention earlier and it's a bit detailing I've been wanting to add to this model since I basically first started it. And that is with the valve stem. This of course being a wheeled vehicle, these wheels are pneumatic so of course you need a place to in order to, you know, top them off with air every so often. And the valve stem detailing is present and it's basically the way I emulated from the real V100 that again uses reference. To fabricate on this one over here, the valve stem is just a piece of floor wire. I went ahead and painted it gold to give it that brass color as they were brass on the real examples. Unfortunately I did not have brass that thin so I had to go and paint the brass as opposed to just utilizing some brass stock but regardless 
the rod was, or I should say the wire was utilized, I drilled a small hole into the rim, in the approximate location as I saw the real one, added the wire, and then on the top for the rubber valve cover, I used one of my cast rubber valve stems that we have here. These I use for the various tire sets that are offered on the ECA catalog. I have them for the Mutt as well as the Jeep, and I believe I also use them on the German trailer as well. And regardless, the detailing is, you know, more than suffice for the task at hand. I snipped off the top portion, drilled a small little hole in the middle so I could just insert the rubber section onto the stem. Once the pieces fit in place, it gives some very nice and very intricate bit of detailing and definitely makes the model look all that much more polished overall. One of the other last bits of detailing that were painted on the model is the lens area for the optic. The optic d does have some detailing integrally printed onto this section as I mentioned before, but now you can see what it looks like fully painted. There's two types of silver paint that were utilized according to the real example that I had some references of. This was all carefully painted with a very precision paintbrush, leaving for the results that we have here. The very last thing that needs to be added in order to complete this area off is a clear printed component that's going to be added in this section which is going to be the outer lens. Once that fixture is added, this portion here of the target is finally completed. The two very last bits of equipment that are needed to be added to this model or to finish it, and it's something that I am not going to be able to do in this video, is the jerry can as well as the Pioneer tools. The jerry can is something that I went ahead and actually purchased off of Etsy. It's a 3D printed unit, and once the unit comes in, I'll be able to see if it will be able to fit on top of the new bracket mount that I have over here and as for the Pioneer tools I went ahead and tooled up and designed a set those are currently being 3d printed as soon as they come in they will be mounted in place in addition to both the jerry can and the tools I also went ahead and developed the buckles for the little nylon straps which are going to be used to actually secure everything in place but all this information is going to be discussed in the next video update as you can see, this model here is basically completed. There are a few components that are still needed to be added, but these are currently being shipped or are currently in production at the printer. As soon as I have these components in hand, they'll be able to be mounted to this model here. And at that point here, this model is 100% completed. So that is something that I'm eagerly looking forward to, as well as I'm pretty sure a large number of you out there who are watching and keeping up with this video series. Like I mentioned earlier in this video, this model here at this point is about 98.8% completed with just those last bits of detailing are all that what separates this model from the end zone. This model here is actually now going to be moved from this location to my great room area where I have many of the other models on display. And it's going to stay there basically until the remainder of the parts come in. Fortunately, these parts are something that I don't have to have the model in the shop to install and something I could basically handle at any location. So from here, this model is going to be moved and then this table over here is going to be the perfect location to start another 1-6 scale project. As for what that's going to be, well, I'm just going to have to stick around to this channel and find out. Hopefully it's something that's not going to take too long for me to go ahead and start and get some progress on, but all that information is best left up for, you guessed it, another video for another day. And with that, that wraps up this project update video for this 1-6 scale Cadillac Gauge V100 armor car, also known as the M706. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content being 1-6 scale project update videos like this one over here, or the other smaller scale model showcase videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new posts of content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build that have been posted since the project start, as well as pictures of the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com, where there are more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.